Welcome to another live pro programming session where we're going to be writing some content for uh, the Lux debugger, which is a new debugger, um, which is totally reinventing the concept of debugging. <laughs> it's kind of a it's kind of a broad and ambitious statement. I'm reinventing a lot of the interface of uh, of the debugger and adding features that we haven't seen in debuggers before. Um, uh, it's definitely a, an ambitious project. So we're going to have a lot of fun. You can try the debugger out today that I'm working on on stream. You can go to luxdebugger.com and you can sign up for the alpha where you can give feedback and help steer the direction of the project. So go to luxdebugger.com, sign up for that alpha. Link in the description. Uh, so let's get started with, uh, let's talk today about what we're going to do. Last time we were working on native visualizers. Um, oh, by the way, before I get into that, uh, I, I love answering questions. If you have any questions, please let me know. Type them in chat, type them in comments. I will explain anything and everything about the, the, the stuff that I'm working on here. So native visualizers, what are they? Well, we have this thing called stud map. It's a standard template library um, um, class that you can use to make maps. Here I have a map of uh, from integers to strings. Here I have a map from strings to integers. And uh, the problem is that in a debugger in like Visual Studio, you want to see uh, logically the, con the contents of the map. You... Um, you're less interested in seeing the actual internals of the map. And so uh, the internals can be convoluted. For example, I think maps in a uh, stud map are implemented using a red black, bind or red black tree or something like that. And so this data structure maps the complicated internals of a stud map to something that is user visible. Okay, let's see how it works for stud vector. Just, I think stud vector is going to be a better example here. So in order to get the size of a stud vector, you have to calculate this expression, right? In order to get the items, you have to calculate this first item and then manually um, search through memory for all of the, the other items like this. It, it's actually kind of like if, if you just print out these internal values, they're, you know, it's, the user is not going to be able to understand the actual logical contents of the stud vector. So same thing with stud map. Um, I've, I've implemented stud, stud vector. This is a lot of the code for, for stud vector. Uh, let's see. Um, so, so what it does to implement stud vector is there's this array items thing and it has a size and the value of the first thing in the array. And then we're actually looking at it right here. It will create um, nodes in the, in, the, in the processes panel tree. Accordingly, it will just create one node for every... And the thing we're gonna do today is we're gonna do the same thing except for maps. Actually, I wanna show it off here. Show off what it looks like. So we're gonna run the debugger. Let's go. This is, to be honest with you, kind of an old slow computer. <laughs> so everything's coming up from swap right now, probably. Um, so we're gonna lo load types, at least the debugger's fast. Oh, wait, I have the vector stuff turned off. So I gotta turn it on real quick. Uh, so we're going to look at what, a vector of string? Yeah, works for me, vector of string. Let's turn that on so we can inspect an example vector of string. These are all my test cases, basically. I don't have an automated test system for these yet because they're part of the UI. It's like really integrated into the UI. So I have to, I still have to build an automated test system for um, testing the UI, which I have some ideas about how I'm gonna do that. And maybe that will be an interesting stream uh, another time. So let's put that breakpoint right there and run. Um, so yeah, a stud vector, and if you open it up, you can see the 
great, the objects that we've added, which are strings of the numbers one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, that we're adding to this vector. So uh, this is the this is the debugger prototype, um, and uh, on the right you see the the local symbols for the natviz types function, which we're currently in. Uh, and this is the stud vector that we're looking at right now. It's a vector of string. And, uh, and, and these are the contents. So we want to do the same thing for a stud map. Okay. Let's talk for one moment about why we're doing this feature. It's always when you're working on something, um, especially something so complicated, it's always important to take a step back and think like, what's the most, what's the next most important thing for me to do? What's the next most important thing for me to do right now? Okay. And that thing may not even be, and has not always been, um, programming. Programming something. In this case, I want people to use the debugger. And so a lot of my time actually is taken promoting the debugger, doing streams like this, right? In this case, um, my goal is to get the debugger to be good enough that I can use it in my day-to-day -day use and replace Visual Studio. Right? right now I use Visual Studio as my debugger as I'm debugging the debugger. I wanna replace that with my own debugger. I can't, uh, I can't ask someone else to use my debugger if I don't actually use it myself, right? That's a little bit disingenuous. So my, my goal is to, if, if I can't use it, certainly nobody else can use it. So it's to get the debugger doing the things that I need so that I can use it as a full-time debugger. Um, and I use a lot of stud vector and stud map. Uh, and so I have ordered the data types that I use in the order of how much that I use them. And I've just been going from top to bottom. Actually, this, this string came after vector, but um, I did vector of int first. And I think I, I did vector of uh, user defined type just afterwards, excuse me. And then I did a stud string, and then I did vector of stud string, which was a little bit more complicated than just a regular, you know, putting the two together was just took a, a little bit more work. And then I started walking through my program and finding all of these cases that I had to fix up. So a, a vector of a, um, a pointer to a user defined type, a vector of a pointer to a, right? These, these were all like edge cases that I had to fix some bugs for. So I got all the vectors and all the string stuff out of the way. And actually this makes my debugger much more usable, usable to me personally. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's almost at the point where I can start replacing the, the Visual Studio and use it full time. There'll be a lot of more work to do, um, but I'm kind of using myself as my own customer. Um, I'm also listening to my actual customers uh, for example, soon I want to think about doing um, conditional breakpoints because a, a few people have suggested to me that conditional breakpoints are a feature that they are very excited about and use a lot. Um, but for now, I'm just focusing on one thing, and that is finishing native visualizers. And then, and I've ranked everything in this file, the, the stud um, that I use the most, and I'm starting at the top. So I'm trying to get the most bang for my time. Um, and so let's go ahead and turn that back off and turn stud map on. The next thing on the list is stud map and we're going to get to it and let's kill this. Um, so a stud map is different as I've mentioned from a vector in that a, a stud vector is a list of array items and all of the values are contiguous in memory, meaning they live right next to each other, you know, one and then the other. Um, a stud map is not like that. It's a tree. In memory, it's a tree. It starts at right here. Okay. Um, my head, arrow, parent. This is, you have to imagine a greater than symbol here. And so this whole thing would be an arrow. So my head, arrow, parent is the head of the tree. And then there's a left and a right. And you have a value for as long as is nil is, is zero. Wait, is nil? Is, is nil is zero means it's not nil. And so um, if is nil is zero, uh, then it's uh, a valid node, value node, and the value is contained in this, um, in this field right here. So we have to take this data, slurp it into the, um, into the debugger, 
interpret the memory of the program using this data, and then spit it back out in the UI of the program. That's what we're gonna do today. So uh, I, I did a stream really similar to this. Last time when we did a vector, we're gonna start in the same place, uh, which is, uh, here we go, natviz.h. Okay, so up here we had array items. And we're pretty much gonna do the same thing, except it's now gonna be called tree items. Tree items, all right. So a tree items can contain a size, head pointer, left, right, and value node. So tree items does not have a condition, I think. Do we have any tree items with a condition? Nope, none that I can see. Okay. Uh, although there is this alternative type junk. I'm not gonna worry about that yet. If I wanna support multi-maps and probably unordered, unordered, oh, okay. No, other, un unordered maps I'll get, but um, uh, interesting. I'm getting distracted by looking at the internals of unordered map. Wow, it's completely different. It's not a tree at all, is it? It is rather just a, it's like an array on the inside. Weird, anyway. Um, apparently a bunch of different uh, objects, uh, implementations in the standard template library, Microsoft's anyway, uh, are, are pretty much like maps and multi-maps are have the identical underlying implementation. So that's interesting. So I'll have to support this alternative type in order to, but multi-map is like super uncommon to use. I'm not gonna worry about it right now, yet. Um, until I need it or a customer tells me that they need it. So we're gonna need tree items. So let's, tree items do not have a condition. Um, we are gonna have a size. And we're gonna to need to make some new, we're gonna have a value pointer. No, now we're gonna have a value node. Value, value node. Value node. Okay, and the value node does have a condition, a name. Interesting. Interesting. It's the only three stud maps, right? Yeah. Oh wait, no, was there another one up there? No, that's match results. Oh, okay, yeah, you gotta give it a name. I mean, I guess that makes perfect sense. Oh, I was looking at this one before. No, this is the one, this is the one, um, this is the latest one, so this is the one, this is probably the one it's gonna actually use for me. Um, okay, oh, I'll have to support this. I haven't seen this before. View map helper, interesting. I'm gonna have to look at the documentation to see what this means. Okay. So uh, in this case, we're mapping a, a name to a value. I think that makes perfect sense actually. Um, so each, where was I? Each tree item is gonna have a size a value node which has condition, name, and inner text. Uh, size already has inner text. Uh, this is the inner text, my XML parser. We'll take that and put it into the inner text object. Let's make a head pointer. Let's organize it the same way as in the Actual file, why not? So that just has an inner text. A left pointer and a right pointer. Left pointer, right pointer. They each only have inner text. I don't think we need to do anything crazy than that. None of it, there are no other flags or anything like that. Anyway, the XML parser will tell me whether I've forgotten anything here. So, head pointer. Left pointer, right pointer, head pointer, 
Left pointer. Right pointer. Good, now we just have to add this to reflection and then the XML will load it all into memory all at the same time. So, uh, wait, no. Natfizz.cpp is where I wanna be. Um, down to the bottom. Array items, tree items. Mm -mm -mm. Oh, I totally lost track of where I am. Um, oh, I, yeah, there we go. Okay. Tree items does not have a condition but it does have a size and four of these. We'll just do a bunch of copying back and forth. Here we go. If I make a mistake here, it will tell me sometimes at compile time, sometimes at run time, but there are checks to make sure that I don't make too many mistakes. Okay. Let's get Head pointer in there. Wait, value point, value node, right? Okay, head pointer, left, right, and value node. Left pointer, right pointer, value node. I explained um, a lot of how this reflection system works and how the XML system automatically loads whatever's in the reflection system in my previous video. So I'm not gonna go into that too much. We're kind of gonna blow through it. Um, but what I just did should be enough to get all of this loaded into from the XML into this in-memory data structure. Um, so if I do this, and I put a breakpoint in processes panel. Uh, oh, here we are, actually, we're right there. I put a breakpoint here and I run it as soon as it compiles. Then I should have all the data loaded in the XML already. I think all of that is just done now. So, Let's give that a shot. We'll run it, we'll go to my little test program. Oh yeah, this right here. This right here. If size is bigger than 100, size equals 100. What happened there is um, the if the vector is invalid, then it lists itself, like for example, its memory hasn't been initialized yet, then it lists itself as having 2 billion nodes or something like that. And then my debugger just spins trying to load 2 billion nodes of basically in like corrupt or random memory. And that kind of craw crawls to a halt. Um, so I limit it to 100. At some point I'm gonna have to do more, some, some more permanent solution there, but. Interesting. Oh, I put the breakpoint in the wrong place. Silly me. There we go. No. Uh, let's try that again. Oh, you know what? You know what happened? It probably hasn't recognized the, uh, the NatViz class. So... We're gonna put a breakpoint in a slightly different place. Find visualizer, I'll bet you this failed. Okay, so find visualizer takes a type, in this case a stud map from int to basic string. Uh, the uh, the address of the object in the in the debugged process's memory, and process ID, and a and a, a functor that returns any memory of the in the in the debugged process and it's supposed to find a natviz type that corresponds and i think maybe it's failing 
which I guess it should because I haven't actually added any of the functionality that needs yet. So let's see here, stud map, there they are. And these should all actually have um, um, expand. Um, that's interesting. Stud map. Oh, I know what I did. I know what I did. I know what I did. I have to put it here. All right, I missed the most important spot. Tree items. Didn't actually hook any of this stuff up. So we have to put it in the expand node in the first place or nothing's gonna work. All right. Now it should load it. Programming's fun, isn't it? Okay, we'll keep that breakpoint in the same spot. Actually, I don't remember whether I kept it or not. Just put that breakpoint right there. Run this bad boy up. I think um, I think recording to video makes my computer slower. Honestly, it doesn't usually take this long to compile. We'll run that bad boy. Okay. Ah, see, I told you, it tells me if I forget something, which I did. Ah. Copy paste error, the best kind. So right here it's going to, um, it's going to find me the set of possible visualizers, which we just saw it actually returns me three, uh, three stud map visualizers. Uh, and then it's going to evaluate them, meaning run through all of that visualizations and see whether they're actually valid in order to um, figure out whether this is a valid visualizer for this object. Where did mine, there. Okay, so that's what this function does. So it returned three possible visualizers ordered by um, priority, and it's gonna try the medium high one first. So let's actually just walk through this code and see whether it works. So it's gonna check all the display strings um, in this visualizer of which there is one, uh, which has no condition. So it should just give me a, a display string. Where is it? Yeah, there's one valid display string. Here it is. It has some inner text. Uh, my pair dot my val two dot my dot. Okay. So actually this should be okay. It should be able to calculate this display string. Oh no, there was an error. Oh no. Okay. Let's go back in there and see what the error was. Uh, it looked like it got this far with no problem. So it's trying to evaluate this expression. Okay. It evaluates this expression. There are no intrinsics or injections. Uh, inject injected methods uh, are uh, stud map. There are no injected methods here, but see vector has um, some intrinsic methods that are like little mini methods that you can define for your for your native visualizer that you can then go use in in other places like here. And so I inject them into the I call it injecting them into the into the parsed um, result. Uh, but in this case, there are no injections. It's not going to be in the cache. Oh, it is going to be in the cache because I I just did it. We're going to don't. Don't even worry about that. Okay, we're gonna skip the cache. Um, find type, 
Should be a valid type. Scope type. Yep. Map of stud string. Uh, okay. Okay. Find dependencies. Let's see how many dependencies we have. Zero. Fascinating. Zero dependencies of stud map. I, I'm somehow incredulous. Mm, let's see. So depend the use of dependencies is... Um, I'm actually compiling a fake C++ file that contains all of the, uh, like the fields that this expression that I want to compile refers to, this expression right here. And so I need all the dependencies of class and then I insert fake dependencies there just so that all these little fields, all of these guys are actually valid uh, so that I can compile that expression. So let's pop back up to here. Find dependencies. So we have a user defined type and it should have some, oh, it doesn't have any members. Really? Why not? Indeed, stud map has no vet members. Okay. Um, wow, I am panicking. <laughs> How could this possibly be? We're going to go to the type sample where the stud map that we're looking at lives. Where is it? Stud map, we're gonna F12 and look at the actual Visual Studio stud map. It is a tree. Um, um, let me see. Can I easily discover what fields exist in this tree without actually having it? Okay, oh, wow. There are no fields anywhere in this file. But it must contain data. Everything must contain data. Okay, let's see whether this the tree actually contains any data. Uh, a static bool, but I don't care about that. Uh, some struct definitions. It has to contain data. Maybe it doesn't see the data because the parent class has the data. Oh, oh, no, it actually doesn't have any fields. I'm so, what? Where is your data, sir? Uh, it's not a parent class of anything. There should be a scary, scary Val for some reason. It's like the funniest name. Microsoft called it scary Val. The scary Val is like the, um, is like the, is like the actual value in the, that's their convention. It's like the actual value that it ends up modifying. Oh, this stuff is just not compiled, but it's actually still part of the class. Okay. I just didn't, I just had to keep scrolling. There are fields around here somewhere. Come on fields. Oh yeah. I definitely just needed to keep scrolling. Um, fields, 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 um, fields, 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 get scary. Let's just do this. There we go. There's a compressed pair in this thing. There, I found it. I found it. It's right here, a compressed pair. In the tree, okay. Well. And there's the tree. Uh, okay, so I have to figure out, this is definitely not where I thought I would get um, hung up, but here we are. I I have to figure out why it's not finding um, these, that member, the compressed pair. And I, I'm gonna guess, I ran out of water. I'm gonna guess that it's because the data is actually in a subclass. 
So we got to go to symbolquery.cpp. There's this file, symbolquery.cpp, that every time you stop in a function, it looks through the DIA SDK, the debug info library. Like it looks through the PDB file and tells me what all the types are of the file. I can pull all the type information out of the debug program using this SDK, which is very ugly to use. Um, so I can pull it all out. And my guess is block locals. My guess is I'm just not getting the parent class data out of it uh, would kind of make sense. Mm. At some point I call get type, uh, get type. Let's go to get type. Uh, so that has a name, UDT members. Yeah, I don't actually see anywhere where I got a parent class. Oh no. So I have to modify my type system to support parent classes for user defined types. Oh no, so this is gonna take some research actually. Um, shoot. Shoot. This is definitely not where I thought I was going to get stalled. But maybe, maybe this video, this presents a little bit of an opportunity. It's a little bit more work than I thought it would be. But, um, but I think the opportunity is that we get to do something a little bit different in this video than we did. Like last video, we just did um, native visualizers. And in this video, <clears throat> native visualizers is definitely the most important thing to do right now, but it's kind of similar to the last video, but I didn't really have anything else to do on stream. Um, but we haven't really dug into the type system and we need to do it. So, oh, there's a lot happening tomorrow morning and I'm trying to stave off all my excitement for tomorrow morning by, um, by programming. <laughs> See, I'm wearing my shirt. This is what's happening tomorrow morning. Hold on, let me let me make it bigger. See my shirt? Crucible Dev Team. Oh yeah, the I think it says uh, quarantine lunch protocol five twenty twenty twenty. Okay, <laughs> uh, back we go to coding. So that's happening tomorrow morning. In the meantime, we're making a debugger. So let's see, where was I? Um, so we have to, so we have to support, support base classes in the type system. This is a concept I've not really approached before. How to represent in memory a basic, uh, a base class. Um, of a user defined type. So I have questions like, how does C Sharp's reflection system do it? It's a pretty good reflection system. How does Clang's reflection system do it? Which is an excellent reflection system. I will just steal their ideas of representation of this data type. Um, I think I'm gonna start with Clang. I'm gonna do it like this, I'm gonna cheat. Yeah, I'm basically gonna turn this video into uh, representing base types instead of represent instead of doing the the tree thing because I think representing base types will take me basically all night, um, and we'll, I'll get to the tr the tree thing later off stream. It's it's gonna be really similar to the vector thing that I did last video. So if you really want to see that, go watch the last video. So let's go to boo boo boo. Um, what am I looking at? C++ parser. All right, so I generate some fake code here. I'm just gonna insert a little bit more fake code. code. Uh, class A and then class B uh, inherits A. There you go, little fake code. No big deal, little fake code. Everybody likes fake code. I like fake code, you like fake code. And then after we compile it, 
Uh, why did I start compiling that when I wasn't done? After we compile it, uh, we will print it to the log. Let me go to, over to CPP parser, put a breakpoint there, and then we will print to the log what happens, and printing to the log will show us internally how Clang represents classes A and B. It will print to literally the Lux debugger's log. Um, and then we can steal their ideas. I mean, I have a pretty good idea on my own of what would be necessary, um, how to represent the data structure in memory. Uh, let's go look at my type file. Okay, we have a user defined type. It has a vector of members. It also could then have a vector of base classes, each being a, not a qualified type, but a, just a regular type. Um, a vector of base classes, you need like a, like a permissions. There's a difference between public, private, and regular inheritance. Um, but that's it, man. I think that's all you would need. You would need a vector because there's multiple inheritance and C++. But we're going to see how C Sharp does it. I'm sorry, how Clang does it. I think I'm much more interested in Clang's version than C-Sharp's version, because Clang's version is honestly like, C-Sharp, their reflection system is built for being the customer, being a program that wants to interrogate itself. Um, Clang's reflection system is built for correctness and thoroughness and power to write a debugger. Like it's way more, not, sorry, not a debugger, but a compiler. It's way more thorough um, and, and academically correct. And I think that's what I need for the types that I'm gonna be representing in the client program because it could be anything. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm like writing to it and modifying it as much as I'm the person reading the, the reflection data, the, type, the data from the type system. Okay, so we got this into the log, so we're the log. Uh, let's grab that, whatever the last log is, open that up, scroll to the bottom, turn off word wrap. And we see we have a record. This is the A class that I made. Uh, has definition, constructors and destructors. It also contains its own record, implicit class A. There's so much interesting about the um, the Clang abstract syntax tree that I haven't learned, but interesting. So CXX record has public, a, it just has public A. What does that mean? CXX, re, CXX record So let's look up the definition, CXX record declaration. Okay. And it's a range of, retrieves the number of virtual base classes. Um, virtual base classes? What's the difference between the verse, virtual base classes and the, and just base classes? I wonder. Oh, virtual base class, of course, base classes that have virtual, so it separates them. Okay, so that's good information that I wasn't aware of before. It, it has to differentiate virtual base classes from non-virtual base classes. That's good. Hmm. Just had an idea that I want to write down. Give me one second. The idea is that, so in my, there's no reason that like a debugger can't help you find, I mean, it's a debugger, right? It should help you find problems. It's what debuggers do. 
And one problem I'm always running into, not always, but like often enough that maybe it's worth doing something about, is that I I always want to have classes that are either, they either have a virtual destructor defined or they are, um, they should either have a virtual destructor defined or be final. Uh, one of those two things should always be true. And if it has no base classes, there's an argument that it should also be f declared final. Uh, and it would be not like, I don't have, like maybe I could do some static analysis because I have all of Clang, right? Like, and I'm gonna be compiling everything anyway. Like here's a crazy idea that I had that a lot of programmers probably balk at. Well, just to finish that thought, like there's no reason the debugger can't point that stuff out to you and be like, hey, this class right here, it has a, uh, it doesn't have a virtual constructor, but it's not declared final. What do you want? Like it, it could show you stuff like that. Um, cool. A crazy idea that I had is what if I trained a neural network to find bugs? Actually, put the stream on hold right now. Put the stream on hold. I'm just going to Google that. Neural network to find programming bugs. Does that exist? Deep learning to find bugs. Yeah, yeah. Turns out I'm not the first person to have this idea. Um. Yeah, like, can we build this into a debugger in a way that is actually useful, you know? Because, like, I can spot errors. It's just patterns, right? Uh, I'm sure that this problem I had before where I was missing tree items here, a neural network could have spotted that because it would have just seen that there's a pattern here, that there's a pattern here, and that that pattern gets reflected here. And it would have been like, hey, you sure you don't want to put something there? Like, uh, I'm sure a lot of programmers would hate that idea, but anyway, that's a long time in the future for me. Not even worrying about that. So let's go back to base classes. I'm not gonna worry about actually representing the difference between base classes and virtual base classes. Um, yeah, like I don't represent methods right now because I don't need that data right now, so it's, like I haven't written a a complete type system. I've only written the type system. What I need which is why I don't have this feature right now. So, so yeah, let's just let's just do this. Um, first of all, we'll delete that. <laughs> Uh, symbol date, symbol query. So we go to symbol query. We go to get, uh, no, get type. If it's a user defined type, then we need to loop over members. Find children is how you get the members. Now we have to go to the DIA SDK documentation to figure out how to get parent classes. So let's see, get nested types. No, that's not what I want. Uh, get lexical parent, get, hmm, hmm. Const type constructor class parent. Oh, there it is. Symbol for the class parent, if any, but there could be multiple. What does that mean class parent? Is it the base class? Lexical parent. No, that's the enclosing compliment.
Maybe it's in one of these other things and I'm just not seeing it in here. Base class. Base class. Each base class for a user to find is identified by the sim base class. Uh, okay, <laughs> you know what I probably, I just have to, I'm probably, this is probably easy. This is easy. This is easy. Okay, watch this. Sim base class tag. Boom. I'll bet this is how you do it. You just call find children and you pass the base class tag in there. Um, UD, UDT base classes. It's worth a shot. Um, and then instead of pushing it onto members, wait, members. Oh yeah, I'm gonna have to. Okay, instead of pushing it onto members, I push it onto base classes. Base classes. Um, which is just gonna have, it's just gonna be a, a user to find member for now. Mm, so let's see, get location type. Are we gonna need that? Do base, do you, base classes have a location? Get location. Yeah, I'm gonna need some kind of location. Find children. Let's go back to user to find types. Find children isn't actually in here. Uh, do, uh, no, I don't have what I need here. I'll bet, I'll bet class parent is actually like for nested types, not for, it's like the nesting parent, not the base class. I'm not entirely sure about that, but let's give it a shot. Get type, get offset, get location type, get offset. It's probably not gonna have a name. Well, I'm just gonna leave all this stuff here Throw it all in this base classes thing. We'll see whether this part works and then we'll see what of these actually does anything. Uh, actually, mm, it is gonna be this class. The, uh, the contains the symbol for the underlying UDT and all properties of the underlying UDT are available as part of this base class symbol. The get type contains the symbol for the underlying User defined type. Oh, so I might have to call get type on it, the symbol for the base class. True if the base class is virtual. False otherwise, yeah, yeah, yeah. This was what I was looking at in the clang. Wow, interesting. Okay. There were errors, let's go fit. Oh, there were actually not errors. Put that uh, breakpoint right there. Here we go. Let's run it. I can't wait to the day that I get to put a nice looking UI on Lux. One thing at a time, it's gotta be usable first, then it can look good later. One thing at a time. Boink, okay. So. Did that find anything? Hey, it did find things. What's the name that I got? Stud tree, yeah, this is the tree that I wanted. Cool, member name is huge. A uh, tree with a bunch of traits. Anyway, it's a tree. Um, let's see whether get type gives me, oh, this gives me, uh, it, it told me, the, this gives me the actual base class. Um, oh, good.
it looks like my wrote my code will do exactly what I want with no additional like I thought I would have to say get type instead of passing in type symbol I would have to pass in mem member sim this shouldn't really be called base class symbol okay but turns out I'm accidentally doing the right thing it just kind of works the same way Okay, does it have a location? No. See, I got uh, hr equals false. The return value is false. It does not have a location type. Does it have an offset? Yes. And the offset is zero. Interesting. That makes perfect sense. And actually, now that I think about it, you... You have to get offset. There it is. Offset of the sub ob object that represents the base class within the structure. Yeah, because of multiple inheritance, you have to have this. Actually, not even because of multiple inheritance. Um, if you want... No, yeah, because of multiple... Yeah, I think if you don't have multiple inheritance, you don't need this. But because you have multiple inheritance... Um, you could have multiple uh, base classes. And so you have to have a different object that represents the base class than that represents the type of the base class. So you have to call this get type to, to get the actual type of the base class so that you can store information that's specific to whether it's a base class, like it's offset in, in the structure, uh, whether it is a virtual base class, this sort of thing. Um, this is kind of... I think ancillary, like if the base class has any overloaded operators, you can just call get type, get type, and then get that from the UDT because it has overloaded operators right here, I guessed correctly. Um, but you know, it's fine. It's not hurting anything. What is an in, what's an indirect base class? Indirect base class. Class is called an indirect base class if it is not a direct base, but it is a base class of one of the... No. Okay, obviously. Okay. So we do have an offset, but not a location type. Let's go ahead and take this out. We're probably going to need that offset. Is that true? Yeah, because we have to so at some point we're going to have to change this. So this member expression means um, like if you say a dot b then that turns into a member expression and you get the base which is the a and the field, which is the B. Now, if A is a uh, has a base class and B is in the base class, then you have to go into the base class and return B from the base class. So this member expression is either like maybe they use a different member, maybe they use some other expression, maybe this like a base member expression or something. So I'll either have to add one of those or change this member expression right here to support. Um, inheritance and that's okay so let's come here and then come here and then make a new one of these and then open this and call this a base class it's gonna have a name and a type but not a qualified type byte offset from the beginning of the UDT This should be from, not to, idiomatically. Okay, so what do we want? The name of the bit. Actually, we don't need the name of the base class. We know the name of the base class because we're gonna about to store its type. So we actually don't really need that. Um, but we do need its type and its offset. Let me just scan in here. See whether there's anything else. Mm, base class marked as const. You can do that? Well, I'm not really interested in 
parsing that because I don't need it in this case. Overloaded, um, virtual, don't need that, don't need that. Okay, so we just need these two things. So then we're gonna add a base class here, base class. So we are now representing base classes in user defined types in the type system. Uh, so now I have to add a user defined type. I have to change this guy size. Oh uh, yeah, size, that's fine. I have to change this guy to um, to include the definition. So then here's a question. So add user defined type is how user defined types get added to the type system. You can see I'm calling it here. But then I have the problem of, this is not a big problem, but do I put member first or do I put base class first? Logically, Naturally, base class would go first, but members are the things that are referred to more. I think more often you care about the members of a base class than about its, uh, members of a class than about its base class. But I, I can't do a default argument because this is a bus and it doesn't support default arguments. So I wouldn't be able to get rid of the base class parameter anyway. Eh, screw it. Vector of base class, base classes. Here we go. Um, base class, we no longer have a name. We do have a type and an offset. Base class is pushed back. The only thing that this is gonna annoy me is that I'm gonna have to rewrite um, some of my tests. But other than that, it's fine. Uh, I actually don't want a qualified type. I just want a regular type, but get type returns a qualified type, so that's fine. Qualified meaning, um, quick side note, the difference between a qualified type and a non-qualified type. If you have int, that is a type. If you have const int, that is a qualified type. Actually, int is also a qualified type because it's qualified as not being const. So. When you see qualified type, that means it's possible that you have a const or volatile or register or whatever attached to it. Um, when you just have type, type, that means that it's you. It doesn't have any information about whether it's const. And the base class. Uh, can you have a const base class in C++? I'm not even sure, but I'm not even going to worry about it. Um, so we don't need it to be a qualified type, and we're just gonna we're just gonna assume that it's not. It just saves a byte or two of memory. It's not even a big deal. But it's not gonna see the the members of a class are qualified types because you can have a const member of a class, but base classes are not. Okay, so then we got base classes. We put them there. Base classes members. Now let's. Come on in here, update this function signature, add user defined type. We're gonna throw that in right there. Oops, like that. Um, now let's go to types. Types.cpp. Add user defined type. We have to add this. Um, we have to add it to the hash. Quick explanation of why types need hashes. Uh, base cl classes. Base class. Why do types need hashes? Um, there are no qualifiers, but wait, there is an offset. Why am I not hashing the offset here? If you change the offset, it should change the type, right? Let's go ahead and do that. And then I'll explain 
am offset. Okay. So in C++, you can multi you can have um, you can have multiple def definitions of the same thing in two different translation units. Um, so in this file and in that file, they both refer to vector class vector. And so, or class vector specifically of int, okay, a vector of int. So if you have these two different vectors of int, the type system will construct a type for each one of them. And it has to know whether these types are equal, are actually the same type. So that's what the hashing does. It allows you to compare two different types without going through and comparing, well, it's they're the same type if all of their members are the same and all of their um base classes are the same and everything is all the qualifiers are the same everything is the same if you just hash it all together you make a complete hash of the type and you um and you save off that hash then then you don't have to do that comparison you just compare the hashes so let's move base class up here just to reflect that it is more basal it is more basular. It comes first. Basular is an is a word. It's an actual word. Base classes. Oops. Okay. Now I'm gonna have to update all the tests. Base classes. Let's kill this guy. What did I do wrong? Tell me. Tell me, compiler. Tell me my errors. Tell me my errors today. I think that's correct. Wait. Do I need this? Yes, I do. Okay. Oh, no errors yet. Yeah, because... Right, like two classes are different depending on, like if, if the two classes are exactly identical, except same name, same everything, except that one has a const member and the other has a non-const member, then they are different classes. Okay, so we no longer need this variable. Just delete that, that's an easy mistake to fix. Let's try again. Um, cannot convert argument one from base class to member base class. See, like that is the sort of thing that, that, well, that's, that's a compile time bug. So the compiler caught it, but wouldn't it be nice if there was a little artificial intelligence in your IDE being like, Hey, Hey, you forgot that, you know, like as you're writing it, you don't have to wait for the compiler as you're typing, the IDE doesn't, right, doesn't care. It's like having a pair programmer, probably just as annoying. It's like Clippy for programmers. I mean, like, <laughs> I'm telling you, a lot of people will turn it off, but for a lot of other people, it will be useful. It would have saved me right there. Like, I wouldn't have had to wait those 15 seconds to wait for it to compile. All right, the tester is where all the errors are gonna be. Shouldn't be too difficult to fix them because I don't have any tests for any um, uh, base types right now. So we're just gonna add some empty. Can I use this syntax? Is this okay to syntax to use or is it gonna get mad at me? It might get mad at me. Don't get mad at me. I think I'm good. Yeah. 
Yeah, it doesn't take that long if it's going to throw errors. I think I'm good. I'm good. And done. And done. You know, I really need to get my streaming set up to, to, um, to output to another monitor. And like I was doing when I did the Final Fantasy streams when I was like recording on another computer. Because this is kind of... Maybe a little bit painful. It's so much slower when I'm recording. I need to. I just need to fix that. All right. So it compiled, and now we're gonna get some base classes, folks. Here we go. Load types. Okay. We should have one base class. We get its type, we get its offset. We get uh, its recursive type. Oh, oops. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. Oh, wow. Whoa. Whoa. Hold on. Hold on. Why is this stack so big? There are a lot of get types there. Like what type is it actually building? Um, too bad I can't see it until I actually return it. Okay, let's see what kind of type it's building here. Uh, wait, it's gonna have a name. Stud string val, oh yeah. Yeah, okay, string val. It is a map from int. You know what I should do? I should make things easier for myself. We're just gonna go ahead and make things easier for ourselves. <laughs> you know, why make things harder for yourself? We're gonna we're gonna start with a map of int to int. It's gonna be easy, and we're gonna um, change these values here: six, seven, eight, nine, and zero. Okay. Yeah, because look at this gigantic stack of types. It could probably be a lot smaller. So we we made a string val type. We're gonna push that back as a member. It has other members? Yeah, even, like this is another example of why you need um, hashes. Um, let's see what kind of type I get here. This get type could return the same thing twice and you don't want to insert it into the reflection system twice. So it uses the hashes to compare to see whether it's a type that it has already made. Okay, that was just a boring, okay, let's go back, let's see what we got here. This is a string val, didn't we already have a string val? Okay, the string val is contained in a compressed pair the compressed pair is contained in a basic string. The basic string is contained in a stud pair. Now we're getting into the map implementation. The stud pair is contained in a stud tree node. The stud tree node, the, the tree node bone is connected to the Oh, this, this one doesn't even have a name. Stud tree node? No? Hello? Why don't you have a name? What's your name, buddy? Name? Oh, this is like the member of a... Uh... No, but this type that I just finished parsing should have a name. What are you? What are you? Definition. Oh, you're like a pointer. Okay, a pointer to the tree node. And that pointer to the tree node is contained within a tree val. And the tree val is contained within another compressed pair. We're almost to the bottom of the rabbit hole, which is in a second compressed pair. Makes perfect sense. It's like a compressed triplet, I guess. 
and that is in the stud tree and the stud tree is the base class of we got it folks stud map okay so we have a base class now um huh that's a lot of data that is a huge uh, okay, so now we have to change this UDP dependency, find UDT dependencies to print not only members, but also base classes. So here's what we're going to do. Okay. Base class. Um, get comprising UDTs. Uh oh. Oh no, this accepts a type. Okay. Get comprising UDT is just like, um, if it's actually a pointer to something, I don't want the pointer. I just want the, it's like strip all that other stuff. That's what get comprising UDT does. So base class is what we want here base class type type get comprising UDT so base class you uh, member user defined type base class this is what I need to do it's all the same stuff base class user defined type um, and actually you know what I'm going to do I'm gonna factor this out. Like so. We'll make uh, another stud vector engine of 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 types. Um, types to scan. Okay, and then we're gonna do stud vector engine type comprising types and then we have to insert types to scan dot insert uh, at the end types to scan dot stud end so we're going to insert at the end it's so verbose man the seat you know what i've decided i've decided to add this to stud helpers do I have a um, vector helper? I know I have a map helper. Anytime the standard template library gives me something overly verbose, I just make a little helper class. I have stud helpers. Oh, I have set utilities. Okay, I'll just add it here. Like I have my own find if and find erase remove. I'm just gonna put it right here. Void, push back. So a template class, watch this. I'm gonna clean the, um, first I'm gonna write what the actual um, syntax is, comprising types. And then I'm gonna show you how much simpler it could have been, comprising types. And I understand why they wrote it the way they wrote it, but 98% of the time, this could actually be const, uh, no not const, stud vector uh, container uh, stud vector of t um, container and then const stud vector of of t append I'll just call it list I guess so list dot insert list append cool now right here I can just say common push back and this sh this push back should have been a member it should have been like this push back 
It should have been this. Okay. Just push this vector onto that vector. Done. Should have been easy. But come on. So instead, I'm just going to do it like this. Common. Make my own little one. Okay. Oops. I wonder whether there are any other places where I can insert, where I can replace this. Yeah, watch this. Um, oh, you know what, I'm not gonna do it here. Cause this is actually code that I stole out of Clang. So I'm not gonna do it there. Let's see where else. Um, oh yeah. Um, no, that's a map. That's a map, that's a map, that's a map. Or uh, some of these are maps and vectors and our maps and um, this is a set. It's a vector. Okay, so let's do this. Common, push back, open set. Children. Yeah, so much simpler. I'm just gonna real click, quick replace everything in my code that looked like that. I think I just did it. Okay, not the most common thing, which is why I haven't needed it for now. But um, good. So now we can do the same. And you know what I can also do? Now I don't have to create a temporary here. I can just put it, I just throw it right in there. Okay. And I can do the same thing here. Um, boom. Boom, boom. So now types to scan, so good. So instead of duplicating this code inside these two for loops, I made two for loops that just push back the types that I wanna scan. Um, and then one for loop that goes through that whole list and scans it all at the same time. Uh, removes a lot of duplicated code here. And then the UDP dependent, uh, sorry, the final list is the one that I'm interested in. Um, yeah, okay, cool. Thank you, GUI.cpp. So now I should have, I should have base classes showing up in my dependencies. Hop back into CPP parser. Going to find, I'm gonna put that breakpoint right there. Mm. I goofed something, where is it? Base classes. So this finds all dependencies of any UDT that I need to um, compile. That I need to compile the expression, and um, so that I can. And it keeps track of them all, so that I can emit little fake classes for it. Is not a member of user defined type. Yes, it is. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? User defined base classes. Uh oh, I'm gonna have to recompile everything now. Great. Freaking great. Here we go. Uh, type is not, oh, I only need this. Another thing that a neural network could have caught. Another thing. The problem, of course, is getting it not to show you all of the false positives. You would need a, quite a bit of training data on it. Um, but actually, I'm like starting to nerd out on neural networks. You could gather that training data by just recording everything that an actual programmer does in their day-to-day -day work. 
right? Like, as you're editing, you're correcting your own errors. Yeah. Just feed those corrections back into the... Probably easier said than done. No matching overloaded function found. Um... um Where are my helpers at? Stud vector. Okay, comprising UDT is a vector of engine type. There's a vector of engine type. Could not deduce template argument for F. Yeah, right. <sighs> That's because there's no F. A neural network could have told me that. Hey, you're not using F. Don't you want to be using F for something? Yes. Yes, it's true that I didn't need F. If I had a pair program where they would just point at it and be like, hey, you forgot this type name F, and I'd be, oh, you solved, you saved me 15 seconds of compile time. Sounds good. We don't have the technology yet. This is now a video where I complain about how we don't have AI pair programmers. Wouldn't that be great? Of course, I work at Amazon and everything that pops into my head is going to be AI related. Uh, no, okay, chill. So this is shared pointer widget. Weak pointer widget. Oh, oops. Um, I guess I needed to do the insert in this case because this is shared pointers and these are weak pointers. Uh, crap. Okay, well. So in the course of doing all, this is actually... Wow, I actually got unlucky in this example and I found the one example that had, um, that contradicts my point. If I, if I do the, um, if I do it the long way here, then it gives an opportunity. It, it goes in and inserts them one by one, which gives an opportunity for you to convert from the weak pointer to the shared pointer. So it does this, it can handle automatic casts. Whereas this guy cannot. I mean, I could just write like a, like a, another version of pushback that does have temp, template, two template arguments. And the F is the second one. And this one is the F. And then it goes and then just does this. Actually, this would be the same internal code. I could write that. In fact, I probably should write that. I'm going to write that now. Uh, and I think I would need, no, I'm not going to bother writing that. Okay. I don't, I don't really need it right now. Okay. Not getting, not getting distracted. Here we go. We're actually not trying to do anything that has anything to do with that. So not getting distracted. User defined types. That's what we're looking at right now. Not this template stuff. I thought maybe if I had a default template parameter, I could different specialize. And I was like, no, I'm not even gonna, not even gonna think about that. Okay. Um, so let's find the visualizer. It's a stud map of int to uh, int. Yep. We get some visualizers. We are there are three of them. We go to evaluate. Um, we don't have any conditions on display strings, so we evaluate one display string. Whoops. I don't even remember where in this code. Oh, that's right, it was evaluate expression. So we're gonna jump into evaluate expression, parse expression and coast. Oh, that's right, I, I, I set a breakpoint where I need it. Here it is, okay. Find UDP, UDT dependencies. So there's only one, and in this case, now there's a base class. <gasps> we have a base class now. 
and it is going to have all of the other depend like stud map should have a ton of dependencies base class it only has a dependency on the base class but the base class the tree has a bunch of internal stuff and so now we don't have any more base classes but they're going to be a bunch of members so there was one member there anyway this vector will now have 11 11 oh my god so this is the stuff we were looking at before look at all this stuff this is all the stuff that a stud map depends on these are all the other classes that i need to emit in my code a tree a compressed pair of compressed pair a compressed pair by itself um a tree value a tree node a stud pair container base 12 no idea what that is about container proxy iterator base 12 i guess a map needs an iterator allocator and stud less what is stud less for any pointer yields a strict total order now that makes perfect sense that a map would want a strict total ordering on stud less i don't know why there's a dependency on it because that means that there's a member somewhere that like store, oh, I guess it would, yeah. So the map stores the comparator that it's gonna to use to compare elements to insert them into the tree somewhere. And so, so now we have a ton of dependencies. Um, so let's see what code gets emitted. We're gonna write all the dependencies out now. And then we're gonna look at, hmm, what? Oh, then we're gonna look at that code. Wow. <laughs> the, na the name of this class, like, it's a template class. So I, instead of writing out all the template junk, cause I actually can't reverse engineer that from the, the compiled program, cause the template's already been specialized. I just write all this junk out um, so it's like a template specialization where the template information is gone and it's a very long template name, but that's fine. So it contains this bad boy that contains one value. Oh, that's the whole myval2.myval2 thing. That all makes sense now. Yeah, that's why there are two, two myval2s. Okay. Uh, this contains a tree val. This all looks fine. The tree val contains a tree node and an int 64. Here's the tree node. The tree node contains a tree node, another tree, oh, a point, a left pointer, a parent, and a right pointer. Also contains a color. Oh, this will be red or black. I wonder why. I wonder why it's not a Boolean. Anyway, oh, it's, I guess they're just using, hmm. I wonder whether it's a Boolean in the original and it got changed to care because of the type. Oh, that's not good, actually. Actually, that's not good. Now I have to go see, because that that should be a Boolean. That should be a Boolean. I have to read this is nil as a Boolean, but it has type care. So that is something, to, okay, I'll check that out in a second. Okay, also a, a stud pair of int to const int. Here's the stud pair, okay. So interesting, I haven't actually seen the container base 12. It must be the parent class of some of these other things. <gasps> oh, and we're not actually printing out parent classes here, so that's something we need to do. So let's go check to see whether these are bools in the original Microsoft code, and then we'll have to print out the base classes in our, in our shell in our UDP, UDT shell, so we'll have to modify that. So let's go to types.cpp. Uh, no, the other types.cpp. I have two types.cpp in this pro in this project. It's probably poorly advisable, but one is the test and one is the actual types program, types um, file. All right, so a map contains a tree. A tree contains a scary tree value. The tree value contains, yeah, that's where the container base is right there. 
I don't know where the t the 12 came from. It should just be called container base. I don't know why it's container base 12. Anyway, the tree value. Oh, that's why. Okay, because actually an enum. Is there anything I could just F12 to skip me right? Okay, here. Um, of a node pointer. Damn it. Okay, so I actually need the template parameter of tree val. Let's try again. Tree. Tree val uh, value type. Uh, traits value type. And that's traits. Okay, one more time. A map, we need the value type here, which is gonna be this. Okay, so it's the, I totally lost track of where I was. Oh, this template stuff is so crazy. Okay, um, tree symbol type, tree iterator type. Um, totally lost track, we're looking for we're looking for is nil. I'm just gonna do this is nil. There. Really? No. No. Just. Just take me to the definition with F12. That's what F12 does. Oh. Take me to the definition F12. Here, it's a care in the original, okay. Whew. Okay. That doesn't bother me so much then. Um, I'm just gonna have to force it to a Boolean, which is easy to do from a care. So back to where were we? Price expression and scope. Um, um, oh, that's right, we have to change right UDT shell. Right UDT shell. Uh, to right here, shell name. Okay, here we go. Kill this. If type dot, oh wait, user defined type, arrow, m base classes. Uh, if it's, if it's not empty, then string base classes, base classes plus equals, some colons in there, for uh, engine types user defined, let's make this const um, base class base class, that's long, user defined type, arrow base classes. So we're gonna loop over each base class, base classes plus equals um, public base class dot m type get shell name. Uh, then I have to add, I guess I have to add commas. Oh, I have to do this stupid thing where I only add com, I don't add comma, I don't add the last, last comma thing. Can't add the last comma. And k equals zero, so I actually have to use the old fashioned. I really wish there were a way to not have to do this. I really wish there were a way I could use a regular range for um, and still get the index out. Uh, stud distance requires iterators and I don't have an iterator here, right? Okay, so I have to do if k 
k is less than user defined type dot m base classes dot size minus one base classes plus equals the comma. So I only write the comma if I'm not looking at the last thing in the list. Okay. Um, and the shell name is that really long template specialized name that I was talking about before. It builds that out of, out of this type. So good. I, I think that will do it. So that will give me my parent class information spit into my shell. This shell information is becoming more and more complicated. This should have been stud string. Thanks, neural network. I wonder whether you could write a neural network compiler. That would be a terrible, terrible, terrible idea. But is it possible? <laughs> if there's one thing you definitely want out of a compiler, it is, um, it is, um, words are failing me. Um, like, it will always do the same thing every time. If you're gonna have that thing power a nuclear power plant, it better be reliable. It better be, what's the word for always deterministic? But I'll bet it is possible to build a neural network compiler, like a compiler that will take source code and then we'll run our neural network and then we'll output a binary that does the thing that that source code. I bet that, I bet that would work. I bet that could work and might even have some applications that are not running nuclear power plants. I bet that could work. I will definitely not write it, but I would like to see it written. I might even use it sometimes for some things that would be funny. So we found all the dependencies. We're gonna write the shell. Oh wait, we're also gonna need the parent thing right here. Okay, we should probably take this and put it in another function. Um, but it's fine. We'll just put a breakpoint inside it and then trying to step past all this stuff. And then we hit the breakpoint and then we see what kind of code it generates. Let's see. Oh my God, I didn't ever use it. Uh, anyway, looks fine. <laughs> um, yeah, at least I know it looks fine. Plus, base classes. Oops, I killed the wrong thing. Uh, so great, we can just say equals get base class, get shell base classes, const engine type, type. Wait, no, <laughs> I'm already writing the definition. Whoop. And then we just th throw that right there. And then we'll put that there. And put that there. Put that there. And then, nope, we have to put this here. And say so yeah, stud string base classes. If it's empty, just go ahead and clean up the code a little bit. Let's see, return nothing. Otherwise, base classes equals this. Drop that down an indent level, return base classes, done. 
And now I do, where is it? Um, um, scope type. No template, no namespace. Cool. My C++ parser now emits base, base classes. That's exciting. Let's go ahead and skip to where it's done uh, generating all the code right down here and see what the difference in the expression is and the, the code is that it compiles. I just think this is so cool, man. I'm so happy to be working on a debugger. I think I've talked about it on stream before, but like, at least with a uh, debugger, like if you write a compiler, it's very unlikely that in 2020, someone is going to use, use your compiler for a new, or even for an existing language. Um, so there we have it. The map has a parent class tree. So that works. Uh, oh, interesting. Compressed pair has parent class less int. Oh, because it's a compressed pair of less int and this other compressed pair. Oh, I actually looked up what compressed pair is. And it um, it's a template class that is an optimization that makes it so that if either of um, if either of the template arguments doesn't exist then it is compiled out of the program entirely. So that's Microsoft being clever. It was originally a boost thing, of course, because of course it was originally a boost thing. Uh, so then the other compressed pair has a, has a parent of the allocator. Um, this tree val has a parent of container base 12. I don't know where the base came from. Um, there are certainly a lot of parent classes here that weren't being exposed before and now they are all right cool does doesn't even have any members in this class but i'm i'm still going to admit it because you never know so this looks good and should compile fine no problems no problems compiling let's go look at the log logs log Log. Don't I have another log up right now? Yeah, we don't want that one. We want this one. Close this. Look at the log. Word wrap on, off. Okay. Cool. It's basically what we want. Um, we got the less int class. Um, actually, you know what? So we have the, where is it? Class map. Map is parent uh, stud tree. Okay, yeah, this works good. Works good. And then we have member expressions that are gonna be a little bit more complicated now because they have to go through the, um, the tree. Implicit cast expression. Oh, that's how they do it. Oh, I don't even need to change the member expression. Because there is an implicit cast expression. So when Clang compiles C++, it, the member expression... There, so I was wrong before when I said that the member expression would neither, either be changed or another expression um, that's like a, another kind of member expression that looks through the base class pointer. Because it just casts to the base class. It just casts the value to the base class. There it is. And a cast is really just addition underneath. It does the cast and then it uses the member expression of the casted value and therefore it never has to worry about base classes in member expression. Very clever, well done, 
clang obvious in retrospect um i love it cool okay so that only took like an hour <laughs> and we have the base class information now um this looks like it compiled properly there are no intrinsics oh do i want to do i want to try and go all the way and see how much of the natviz i can finish tonight why not why wouldn't i i'm here let's do it um so do i have an implicit cast expression no so i definitely have to well i have a cast expression so that's good enough um do i need implicit cast no, implicit cast is a subclass of cast, and it doesn't have anything interesting in it that cast doesn't have. So in this case, uh, okay, so I have the trivial, I have the trivial um, case here where uh, you can see where if the two types are the same, then I just return the same thing. Uh, here I have a special case for converting integers between integers. Here, this is none. Of, this is neither of those cases. This is converting a class to a class. So it's converting a um, unchecked derived to base. It's converting the map, the stud map, to the stud tree with an unchecked derived to base comparison. Uh, so what I need to do is just check whether one class is a subclass of the other class. And if so, do an addition. If, so this is what we're going to do here. Um... Where's the type? Hmm. I need to check whether expression type is a sub, is a, no, sorry, whether sub expression type is a subclass of expression type. If expression type is the base class, then we can always cast to the base class. And that should be fine. But then the question is, which, so all that we're actually gonna be doing is a pointer addition and then changing the value.m type. And the question is how to get the new value.m type. So I think what we have to do is, um, let's go look at clang type. This is what we have to do now. Clank type. Give me clank type. Boom. Base class. Searching for base. Get base element type on safe? No, I don't think that doesn't sound like it. Um, there's a lot of stuff here. I'm just going to scan for methods that return a type pointer. Um, that, uh, yeah, I guess that return a type pointer. Get contained auto type. Get array element type no type qual. <laughs> okay, get the base element type of this type. Is that actually what I want? The base element type? No, I think that's for an array. The base element type. Hmm. 
there should be like a oh, oh wait i looked at this before i literally looked at this before there was like a um bases list where was that wasn't i looking at wasn't i looking at it the bases what was i looking at um Oh, no, I was looking at the CXX record statement or expression. Um, mm, mm. Can I get the record here? Get pointy. What is that? Get as CXX record declaration. Hmm. So I guess I could just get the record and parse the record declaration and not use the type system, but rather use the AST. And then the record declaration will have the bases in it. Is that what I want to do? Is that what I should do? Hmm. Um, I, you know, I don't think that this can be what I want because there's only one of them, but at the same time, let's just do this real quick. Clang type base class. It's not guaranteed that a type has a base class. I'm just back at the same. What is this, CXS base? How to get the base class from this example with Clang. Just wanna make sure that there's nothing that I, I don't think there's anything wrong with with uh, with grabbing the record and getting all the information out of there. Yeah, let's just do that. Okay. So if expression type get, gotta get that record. Get a CXX record declaration. Get a CXX record declaration. Uh, we want to make sure we want to test whether the sub expression has This is what we want. So the sub expression is the um, child class and is converting to the base class. So then we're gonna do, now we have a record. I wonder whether I can just do this for Base class range. I don't know what this type is right now yet. We'll figure it out soon. CXX record decal bases. And it's not virtual. So I don't need V bases. If uh, expression type equals. Uh, actually, let's just compile that and see what the type of it is. See whether this works at all. Whoop. Uh, yeah, that broke somehow. Sub expression type on 
declared identifier. That's because I got, well, that's a good sign. Just got the case wrong. Okay, that appears to be good. So, um, let's see what type CXX base specifier. I'm totally cheating using Visual Studio to tell me the type here. Clang CXX base specifier. Is that gonna work? Okay, what on earth is a CXX base specifier? Oh, it's gonna be the same thing. Base specifier. Yeah, it's gonna be the same. The same thing, you need like a a class that represents a base class that has things like, what are the, is base of class? What are the offsets? Is there an offset in here? Um, get type, yeah, there's the get type. It doesn't talk about offset, I guess, because it hasn't, at this point it hasn't been, um, maybe it does know, maybe it might know offsets, hmm. No, I guess when it's in the AST, it doesn't know about offsets yet. Maybe. Anyway, we can just say, if base specifier makes perfect sense. If exp exp expression type equals, uh, CXX base, specifier get type dot get type pointer all right so this is this is going to be progress problem is it's not recursive so it will only identify if it is the direct parent There's gotta be like a... There's gotta be a better type comparison. There's gotta be like, t like I can... I'm wondering why this functionality of comparing types like this is not built directly into Clang. Because this is something that they're going to need if they're going to emit code and provide errors, right? Like, um, you, you don't even, you can't even construct a valid AST abstract syntax tree if you aren't aware about whether these two types are implicitly convertible because it has to emit the implicit conversion expression node in the AST. So it has to be able to compare types. Get as Clang type comparison. Uh-huh. Maybe it's in qual type. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I guess it might make a little bit more sense that qual types are comparable. Hmm. 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 But still no cigar. Hmm. 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 Okay. Hey.
I actually don't want whether they're identical though. I want whether they are convertible. And this is what I should have done here. I realized that I am um, comparing pointers instead of comparing types right here. But anyway. Uh, yeah, we'll just get rid of that. Um, but yeah, it doesn't. Okay, clang R two types castable. Dustin, stop talking to me. I'm trying to code on live TV. Explicit cast expression. Check whether primitive types are castable and see. Oh, that's not. Yeah, it must caught. It must exist here somewhere. But but I don't know where. Okay, so then what we're going to do is just. Do it ourselves, I guess. You know, I think I'm just going to, you know how I'm going to solve this problem? And I, at some point, I'm going to, oops, I'm going to dig into Clang enough that I'm going to know um, uh, the answer to how to how to check in Clang whether two types are in, uh, implicitly convertible. Until then, I'm going to write this comment. This only handles a single level of base class. Note, this will probably create a bug at some point. If the standard template library, so this is the, this is the thing though, like my code evaluator, my code evaluator only handles the standard template library right now. Um, you know what I can do is just make this really simple. I'm going to make this super simple. Um, if I have a base specifier, base specifier get type, get type pointer, uh, I can just say like, if my if my base class also has a base class, assert. And that way when I need to, yeah, this isn't even multiple inheritance. This is like multi-level inheritance, right? If A inherits B inherits C, which I'm also not a big fan of, and I try to avoid um, generally, like I don't think that object inheritance is an inherently bad thing, so to speak. Um, the, the craziness comes in where like, like, like you say, multiple inheritance and, um, and deep inheritance, uh, kind of conclusion that I've come to that I feel like isn't talked about enough. It's not the fact that there are trees in our inheritance. It's that they're complex trees. And so I find if I keep my programs shallow in their inheritance structure, structure, that it makes them a lot easier for me to understand. Um, so I'm just going to, like, all I need is one level of inheritance right now. I don't know the clang function that lets me compare two types to see whether they're implicitly castable. So I'm going to um, just do the easy thing and put an assert here. Assert. Um, CX, uh, I can put it right, put it right there. CXX base specifier dot, um, this should be a dot, dot get type. <clears throat> um, wait. Oh, I guess I need this here. Get type. 
pointer. That's long. <laughs> get type dot get type pointer arrow. I have to get the record. Another arrow bases dot size. Did I do that right? Um, wait, do I even need that? Can I get bases from from here? No. Can I get CXX record? No. Okay. CXX record. Okay, get a CXX record record. And bases is a base class range. What is it? Base class range. It is a LLVM iterator range. Does it have size to find? I don't know. We'll see. Uh, uh, multi level inheritance not yet supported. There. Now I don't have to think about it. And when I do finally have to think about it, it will blow up in my face, which is exactly what I want it to do. So I, I'll know that I'll have to handle it later. Base specifier, okay. So now, if the base specifier type is the cast expression type, in other words, we're casting to the base class, then, Oh my God, here we go. Value equals sub expression value. Wait a minute. Sub expression value, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, 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 let's get the pointer out of there. Uh, pointer, <laughs> no, pointer to uh, object, object equals buffer to type, get that pointer out, um, 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 value dot, dot m value, uh, object plus equals, oh wait, so we have to, oh no, we have it right here, value dot m type, oh, here's what else we have to do. Uh, we're already in the engine, right? Yeah, we're already in the engine. So, user defined. Uh, that'll be const. User defined. We have to get the offset now. Um, user defined type equals get type definition. User defined. Oh, I have to do this. I was, I was thinking it was looking a little weird. Types. Yeah, types. Types colon colon. And we say value.m type. Okay. Make sure it is a user defined type. Expected type to be user defined. Um, get name. Value.m type. Make it a C string so that I can print it here. Okay. So far, so good. So, user defined type dot. Oh, so now. Oh, I actually have to. I actually have a little bit more work to do. I'm not quite done yet. I have to dig the user defined type out of my, so like there's the clang list of base types and there's my list of base types. And I have to dig out of my list the one that we are, cause they're, cause the multiple inheritance could be a thing, but actually it's not a thing because everywhere that I just, um, Everywhere that I'm dealing with right now doesn't use multiple inheritance. 
So this could be another situation where I could say assert um, user defined type dot uh, oh arrow m base classes dot size equals one expected one base class for type. Like the danger of doing this is that my customer could run into these asserts. I'm kind of betting that my customer doesn't run into these asserts because I am going to test this very thoroughly before I hand it to my customer. But I write so many asserts that I am surprised that um, everything hasn't completely blown up in my face by now, right? Like that I'm just not just like firing asserts all over the place. Um, and that's because I try and test it as thoroughly as I can before I send it out the door. And when I do hit an assert in production, I just pull the whole program down, dump a stack trace, and then I know that I have a problem and I try and fix that immediately. It's like, you know when your, um, you know when your room starts to get a little bit messy? It just kind of snowballs and keeps getting messier and like messes have, um, have like inertia, right? They just keep getting messier. And that's kind of how I treat this. Um, my dog just knocked on the door. Did I not take him for a walk? Buddy, didn't I take you for a walk? I did, I'm pretty sure I did. No, you just want food. I'm not done here and until I'm done, you're not getting dinner, but don't worry, we're almost done. You're a good dog. You're a good dog. He's paying attention to me. What a good dog. Hold on, hold on. Stream's gotta see the dog. Hey, buddy. Hey, does Stream see the dog? Maybe. Possibly. Hey, hey, you're a good dog. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> Interrupted by a dog. I'll be, I'll be done soon. Okay. Okay. Love you, bud. Um, where was I here? This type name, get name, has to be the name of Go lie down, bud. I'll be with you in a minute. So I have to get the name out of this. Wait, that's not guaranteed to be the same. Oh, that's not guaranteed to be the same at all. Okay, I'm just gonna assume that it is. There's like no way these two can be different, right? Can I get a name out of a type? Can I at least print it and see whether it's the same? The reason I'm thinking they won't be the same is because Microsoft formats their type. I don't know this for sure, but I'm almost certain. I have to account for the possibility that Microsoft formats their type names differently than Clang does. Right? And a difference of either, even one character, get type class name. Well, it's worth saying const care name equals, we'll just see, see what it is. I'm sure it'll be different. I won't be able to actually test to make sure that the name's the same, but I'll just dump it to this. Um, let's dump it to this variable and see when, take a look at what it is. Name equals. Uh, cast expert arrow get type dot get type pointer arrow get type class name. Okay, I'll check that out in the debugger when I'm in the debugger. Okay, now, 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 now. So I'm just going to assume that my base class const type base class is the first and only base class. And so I can say object plus equals 
Oh, so I'm gonna need I'm gonna need another of these. Base class user defined type. And this is finally where my offset is stored. And now I can store that back in the value equals type to buffer. Uh, uh, um, um, object value dot m type equals base class return uh, sub return oh yeah sub expression result who That was some code, folks. Let's put a breakpoint right there. Size is not a member of iterator range. C declaration of iterator range. I would like to, hello, double click. Oh, that's why it didn't open it. Um, I compiled this. It should decal C plus plus decals <clears throat> CXX. Here it is. Why couldn't it open it? Uh, probably the the difference and um, forward slash just confused it. Okay, iterator range. You lied to me. <laughs> it's totally not defined here. LLVM ADT. Okay, I'm gonna go hunting for that file. I have to know what's in it. Include, wait, no. LLVM project, LLVM. Include LLVM ADT. Um, Iterator range. Okay, what are you, iterator range? Oh no. You don't have a size. Oh man. Empty. It has an empty. I will use it. No, no, no. I actually don't want empty. I want size equals one. Um, no, no, no. I do want empty because I want the parent class to be empty. Okay. Whew. I'm at the point where it's like I'm getting tired and I don't want to have to write code. <laughs> Whoops. Mm. Oh, that's easy. Dot M type. Yes, it is. Oh, user defined. Oh, I have to say, um, base class. Oh, actually, oh, dang, dang. I don't need you or you. All I actually need is you. I can clean that up a little bit though. Let's see here. Type, user defined, base class. This is, this is what I'm actually gonna do, base class. And then this will be base class dot M offset and base uh, type is base class dot M type. Uh, yeah, that's a little better. Let's try that. Cleaning up with these errors, let's go. 
user defined types types user defined where's that neural network to help me man engine type to buffer no matching type to buffer um Oh, 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 type to buffer. What am I missing here? Oh. Mm, I guess that's fine. Honestly, why don't I just return the vector here? I wonder. There's no reason I can't do that. Sub expression typo, I deleted this. This actually would have been useful to have. Maybe I should bring it back. Yeah, I guess I'll bring it back. Uh, const clang. Uh, is it? Type arrow, sub expression type. We'll make it a qual type, why not? Get type. Oh. Okay. Yeah, I should keep things as qual type because I get this comparison operator for free if I keep them as qual type. Expression type. Expression type. Does qual type give me. Is un is uns unsigned no. So I just have to say dot get type pointer. That's fine. And then I will do uh, expression type. Oh, and then also sub expression type dot get type pointer. No big deal. You can always turn the qualified type into the type. But you can't go the other way around because you lose the qualifier info and then you won't be able to do comparisons anymore. Okay, we're getting somewhere. We're out of errors. No more errors, folks. So we got our breakpoint. We're performing a full link. Okay, this is big, people. I recompiled one too many times. <laughs> That's basically what happened. I'd be happy if I could just get this one expression to evaluate. And then, like, I've been doing this for too long. I'm tired and I'm going to bed. And tomorrow, I'm going to play a lot of Crucible. Okay. Wow, it takes a while to... Okay, there we go. That full link. It is no joke. I do appreciate how my debug version of Lux, which has... Mm, order of magnitude all the features that I need is actually much faster to start up than Visual Studio and actually start debugging things. 
Cool, so we have some code. I don't think the actual generated code has changed. Everything there is the same. So we're gonna go and generate it. Okay. So actually all this is the same. I'm gonna remove these breakpoints because now we're gonna evaluate. We wanna get, there it is, there it is. Okay. So we are in a cast expression, which secretly underneath is actually an implicit cast expression. Um, oh no. We can't get the record declaration. <laughs> oh, does that ruin the whole plan? Should I have, should I have checked that before I tried to do all this stuff? Oh no. Wait a minute, the sub expression is the parent class? Yeah, so that's the one I would need to look up. Okay, let's see, which which is the thing that failed? Sub, it's definitely the get a CXX record declaration that failed. Everything else worked fine. Of course, why wouldn't it? Get type, get type pointer, get as tag declaration, get as tag type. This is probably the thing that returns null. No, this is fine. Yeah, I don't know, there's some magic in Clang where with these automatic casting get as functions. They are very magic. So it is not a tag type. Um, meaning you can't turn it into a record declaration. Um, okay. Okay, okay, let's come back to this. Um, hmm. We are consternated. All right, well, I think that means that we're gonna have to maybe look up the way to do this actual cast and clang. Um, because is there anything else that we can do otherwise? Get base type identifier, get retrieves the pointer to the name of the base type. That's like assuming that there's only one base type, so that can't be what I want. Uh, come on, come on. How do I, how do I cast? How do I check whether two types can be casted to another? whether a type can be casted to another type. All right, I might have to admit defeat for this one. Cause I'm falling asleep. <laughs> we did make a lot of progress though. Damn, yeah, okay, I will have to do some deep digging around in the Clang source code 
to figure out how they generate um, implicit cast conversions and where they check that uh, those conversions are valid. It has to be in there somewhere. It has to, because Clang does it every time it compiles anything. Um, but not going to do it now. It's getting close to midnight. I'm very tired. So we're going to call it right here. We made great progress. Um, we were able to get all of the base classes um, from the from the compiled program type data, load them into our own type system, uh, and start uh, using them to, to do logic in our program. We need to be able to cast to a base type if we are to ever... Um, honestly, this is like a thing we needed anyway because we need to show base types in the debugger. If you have type A, which um, inherits from type B, and the user opens type A, it should, it should show the type B stuff in there somewhere, right? It should be like, hey, here's all the type B stuff, here's all the type A stuff, it should show all that stuff. Uh, right now it doesn't do that and have support for it. So we needed to build this support anyway. This is like basic functionality of your debugger, and we have it now. Um, and we also need it to be able to show stud map because stud map depends on stud tree. So great progress here, but we'll have to continue it another night. So one more time, um, go ahead to luxdebugger.com if you want to try this debugger. Uh, once a month, I'm releasing updates that have um, whatever new features I've been working on. This is native visualizers. This is getting the debugger uh, in a place where I can use it for to debug itself um, in in day to day work, it's very close to that now. So possibly by the time you watch this video, it may even be ready for you to use. But even if it's not, you should give it a try. You should give it a swing because um, you will be able to steer development and offer feedback that would be very valuable to me. So uh, just go to luxdebugger.com, sign up for the alpha, and you'll be inducted into an exclusive community of people who are helping build this thing so and with that we'll sign off thank you and we'll see you next time